Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Matt Dugan with the City of Austin Planning and Zoning Department, and welcome to the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. Uh, so we do these speaker series throughout the year. We bring in folks from uh, around the country to talk about issues relevant to the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan, um, especially related to our eight priority programs. <clears throat> um, Today's event is sponsored by the City of Austin Planning and Zoning Department, but we also partner with other organizations uh, to put these events on. Uh, for example, next month we're working with the AARP to bring in Jana Linnott to talk about age-friendly issues. Uh, but today's talk is about the suburbs. Uh, we've got Chuck Marone here. Um, personally, I'm fired up about this, this discussion. Um, you know, Austin's a great city. We do have some major issues. Uh, we've got a housing crisis. We've got wicked transportation and uh, traffic congestion, and we got uh, inequity problems as well. Um, you're just curious real quick, uh, show of hands, who here, who here lives in the suburbs? Okay, okay. Um, so that's good. Uh, you know, along with those issues, I feel like in Austin, when we talk about growth and development, we're actually, we're having the wrong, we're having the wrong conversations. Um, and so my hope here is with, uh, with Chuck being here, he can help us start having the, uh, the right conversations on, on growth and development. Uh, Chuck is a founder and um, president of Strong Towns, uh, a nonprofit that's a national thought leader on growth, development, and the future of cities. Uh, he's got a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and is a professional engineer. Uh, he's also got a master's degree in planning and is a certified planner. Uh, he's authored a couple books and also produces a lot of content on the Strong Towns website. Uh, so with that, join me in welcoming Chuck Marone. Thank you. We good? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks. It's very nice to be here. I, I love Austin, and I'm uh, excited to be back. How many times have I been here, Hayden? Four or five? Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got a, we, we have more Strong Towns members in Austin than in any other city in North America. Yeah. So I feel very much at home here. There's a really robust conversation. And I, I love being introduced, you know, after describing <laughs> the challenges you face, like wicked traffic. And uh, what was the housing one? Like a, you know, yeah, crisis, yeah. <laughs> um, I will share with you what I know and, and or believe I know. And we'll figure out if, if I can help you think through any of these crises and, uh, and what have you. Uh, I'm a Minnesotan, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to downplay the extent of my knowledge and expertise, but we'll go from there. Uh, <laughs> back in 2008, I, I was struggling with this intellectual question on why our cities were struggling financially. Why, even in places where we were having huge amounts of growth, did we struggle to come up with money to do basic, basic things? Uh, I was living in a community that was growing very quickly. When I was a kid, my, uh, the little town where my family farm was was 1,000 people. And all of a sudden, we were 9,000. Uh, like, how did this happen? It just happened overnight. Yet, taxes were going up. We had no money to do anything. Uh, at one point, uh, the city that I live in now, about 20,000, uh, we came up with $9 million to widen out a, a shortcut around the south side of town. At the same time, we were laying off police officers, firefighters. We actually came up with, we were going to shut down the streetlights overnight. Like, why have streetlights if they're not on at night? We we're going to shut them down overnight to save money. Uh, we closed the fountain at the park. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't fix a, a pothole or a crosswalk because we didn't have the money. And I, I asked myself, why are cities struggling financially? Why, in all these places I was working and seeing, were we, despite having all this growth, seemingly so short of cash? So what we're going to do today is go through and, and talk about that and answer that question and then talk about how we think differently about things. Mr. Audio Technical Man, is my presentation... I, I see I'm flipping the screen, and it's, yeah, it's working on your screen, but not on anyone else's. So that's... Uh, you don't need to look at me looking at you. Uh, that's, that's less helpful. How are you doing, Sinclair? It's so nice to see you. Okay, good. All right. Let's start here. 
And I, I want to put this idea in, in your head because it's a, it's a really important one. These are two artist renderings of ancient civilizations. The one on the left is an ancient city called Ur. The one on the right is, of course, ancient Rome. When we look at these places, we realize and understand that they were built around the dominant transportation technology of the day, that, of course, being your two feet. People would walk everywhere, and so the size, the scale, the distances, uh, uh, all of this was based around a society of people who walked. You can fast forward to, uh, this is my hometown back in the early 1900s. I come from Brainerd, Minnesota. That's about two and a half hours north. You're, you're nodding and smiling. You're what? Where? Oh, nice. So Brainerd's about two and a half hours north of Minneapolis. It's the Minneapolis vacation area, right? Uh, uh, this is what it looked like back in 1904. And people would arrive here by train. They'd arrive by stagecoach. But once they got here, they would, they would walk everywhere. And so the size, the scale, the spacing, the distance between different types of things you would do on a normal day, all this was based around a society of people who walked. Beginning in the early 1900s and then accelerating after World War II, we began to build cities around a different transportation technology, that, of course, being the automobile. We came up with different building types, different building styles, different ways of arranging things on the landscape. If we were to go out and ask people today to explain this transition, they would likely talk about it in terms of progress. We used to be a society of people who walked everywhere, so we built cities around people who walked. Now we drive everywhere, so we build cities around people who drive. Someday we will have jet cars, and we will build cities around people with jet cars. And someday we will teleport, and our cities will look completely different than they do now, right? This, this, is, a, this is a very comforting way to look at it. It's a narrative of progress. And it's comforting because it puts us on this continuum of things always getting better. There's another way to look at this that isn't quite as affirming. And I want to put this notion in the back of your head as a way to think through the challenges that we face today, the crises that we face. When we look at these cities, these ancient cities, even by the time you get to ancient Ur, like 4,000 BC, we have to understand that humans had been building cities for thousands of years. The ideas behind doing this were developed through trial and error experimentation. People would try things. What worked, they would keep and expand upon. What didn't work, those ideas would go away because those people would die, right? Like that, that, that experiment failed. It didn't go on. And so by the time you get to ancient Ur, you have people who had been experimenting with how to build places for thousands of years. By the time you get to ancient Rome, you have a pattern of development that had been honed and refined by trial and error experimentation over a long, long time. And by the time you get to my hometown in the early 1900s, you have an approach to growth and development that was not only highly adapted to us as humans, but was essentially universal. We can go around the world and see different architectural styles, different building materials, but the basic layout, the essence of the design, the shape, the spacing, the distances between different types of things, all of this was scaled very similarly. Different cultures, different continents, different latitudes. When we look at this style of development, even though for most of us this is all we've ever known, it's important to understand how young this concept is. We didn't test this out in Oklahoma for a couple hundred years, right? Take the best ideas and bring them here to Texas. We came up with these ideas, right, largely from, you know, European intellectuals and think tanks, the hierarchical road system, separation of uses, modern financing. All these things are theoretical constructs that we just took and applied all at once to an entire continent. It is important for us to understand how big of an experiment this is. No society in all of history has tried to reshape an entire continent, not only the way people live and interact with each other, but the political, the cultural, the social, the, the economic dynamics of that entire system. What we're going to talk about today are some of the implications financially of that development pattern. When we look today at the way cities grow, there's three primary mechanisms that are used. This is different than 100 years ago. 100 years ago, if Austin was going to experience growth and jobs, 
Those are going to be byproducts of things we did locally. Today, those are shared responsibilities between local government and state and federal government. So we see growth happening through transfer payments between governments, state and federal government coming in with grants and programs to help us create growth and jobs, transportation spending, and then debt, private sector debt, public sector debt. When we look at these mechanisms and look at the way they're used today, we use them to create growth. And of course, growth is important to us because it gives us the money we need to do the things we want to do. One of the reasons why Austin is looked at as such a successful place is because you are growing, right? <laughs> the growth solves a lot of ills, as I'm going to show you here in a little bit. It's important for us to step back and understand what happens with these transactions. When the federal government uh, comes in uh, with a grant, when the state comes in with some type of program or subsidy, when the DOT comes in with some big project, uh, or when uh, the private sector comes in with leveraged capital, we as local taxpayers, we as the local government, might have a little bit of match. We might have some money we got to spend to upsize a pipe or a little bit of staff time. But the bulk of the transaction, the bulk of the investment, is being paid for by somebody else. All those mortgages, all those commercial real estate loans, all that, the, those are costs that other people are spending. We, however, get the benefit of the new growth. Now we have the new tax base, we have the new, uh, tr we have the transaction fees, we have the new sales tax revenue. The catch as part of these transactions is that we, we, the local government, the local taxpayers, we agree that we will take over the responsibility long term of serving and maintaining all this stuff. We will fix the roads and the streets and the curb and the sidewalk, the pipes, the pumps, the valves, the meters. We'll provide police protection, fire protection, and all those services. That, that's our part of the deal. We are, in a sense, exchanging a near-term benefit in cash for a long-term liability. There's only one or two ways that this makes any sense. Uh, if we think of ancient Rome and say, you know, we want to be around for a long time, like ancient Rome, right? Like we're not building for one generation or two generations. There's only one of two ways that this strategy makes sense. Either growth continues at ever accelerating rates. In other words, we're gonna always be able to generate a whole bunch more new growth. That new growth will pay for all the promises we made in the past. Or the pattern of development, the way we actually go about laying out and building things is gonna generate for us more wealth and prosperity than it does expenses. Now, everybody in this room understands that this first assumption is not true, right? It's not mathematically possible. I realize you live in a high growth area, but you're not going to grow exponentially forever. Unfortunately, the second assumption is also not true. And for a little bit of time here, I'm going to get a, a, a touch technical with all of you. One of the things we did early on at Strong Towns was to kind of reject the orthodoxy that uh, you, know, you cannot measure value in our development pattern. There, there's this theory that we've called now the quantum theory of economic development that I, th I think a lot of people involved in the system today kind of adhere to. I remember when I was an engineer, I would work on projects that didn't make any financial sense. And I would say, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. And what I was told is that, Chuck, you can't look at them in isolation. They're all interrelated and interconnected. And so you just have to kind of assume that you know, even though individually none of the projects make sense, when they're added together, it comes up to this greater whole, thus the quantum theory. Uh, what we said is that, okay, we can actually test this theory by looking at parts of the system that are essentially very simple, not a lot of background noise, not a lot of stuff going on. And those places, if this theory is correct, should actually be really, really profitable in a dollars and cents standpoint. Thus, this is a dead-end cul-de-sac. Residential homes, no through traffic, no commercial traffic. The only reason this road exists is uh, to serve the people who live on it. When it was built, the city paid half the cost. The property owners paid the other half. We asked the question, based on the revenue the city's collecting from the people who live on this road, how long is it going to take the city to recoup what they just spent to build it? The answer is 37 years. Now, the road won't last 37 years. And when it falls apart, it's 100% the city's responsibility to go out and fix it. 
Here's a, another development. This is, again, a residential development. You'll see there's a closed loop, the dead end cul-de-sac. This is the end of the line. There's no through traffic, no commercial traffic. The, the only reason this road exists is to serve the people that live there. Uh, it was built in the 1980s. The costs to build that were rolled over into people's mortgages, right? The developer paid those costs, and the people picked that up in their home prices. Uh, they've been paying their mortgage for years. They've been paying their taxes for years under the assumption that the government would come in then and maintain their roadway. Uh, when that happened, the cost was $354,000. We asked the question, based on the revenue the city's collecting from these property owners, how long uh, will it take them to recoup the amount of money they just spent to fix the road? The answer is 79 years. Now, the road won't last anywhere near that long, so we said, okay, let's say the city wanted to try to collect enough money from these property owners between now and the time the road fell apart to actually have the money to go out and fix the road. What would that mean? It would mean an immediate tax increase of 46% with additional increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all that money going just to maintain the roadway the sewer, the water, the storm sewer, vastly more expensive undertakings. Now, sometimes people say, okay, Chuck, uh, we get it. We know we lose money on residential. We make it up on commercial. Uh, to which my response is, I don't know any corporation that loses money on 90% of what it does and tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would think that was a smart business strategy. Nonetheless, We've kind of culturally convinced ourselves that if we just have enough commercial property, it, it doesn't matter what happens in our residential neighborhoods. This is a business park. This is one of those build it and they will come kind of investments that we see uh, all over. Uh, this was built in the mid-1990s. It's now completely built out. Every lot is occupied. The city felt this was such a good project, they wanted to repeat it. They wanted to build the exact same thing on property they own right next door. We said, if we could build the exact same thing at the exact same cost and get the exact same amount of investment, would that be a good project? In today's dollars, it would be $2.1 million to build. There's $6.6 .6 million of tax base there. Uh, among that tax base, four of the lots are a church. Two of the lots are a school bus maintenance building owned by the school district. One is a county maintenance garage. One is a city maintenance garage. All these are important facilities, but none of them pay any taxes to the city. Of the remaining ones, the ones that actually pay taxes, every single one was either sold for a dollar and or given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into the park. For the sake of our analysis, it's the only way we could make the numbers even remotely work, we had to assume that when this new park was built, every single lot within it was developed within 12 months by a non-subsidized full tax paying entity and that every single penny of revenue went to pay down that bond. If that were the case, it would still take almost three decades, 29 years, for the city to break even. That's three decades where everybody else's taxes would have to go up to provide police and fire protection, to sweep the streets, mow the ditches, and do every other service that is needed. And that's in the most wildly optimistic scenario. Now, in the early days of Strong Towns, I used to go through and do like 15 of these. Um, we're very proud of all of our case studies. If you go on our website, and I'll give you that address at the end, uh, there's a whole bunch of case studies on there. You can go through them at your pleasure. Uh, I found that after three, people started to you know, break down, and it didn't go well. Uh, so I'm just going to skip to kind of explaining what's going on. And, and this is easy to grasp. You will get this. It will make intuitive sense. Uh, but I am going to use charts to explain it. I'm an engineer, so I kind of like charts. Uh, bear with me, and we'll get through this, and then four slides of charts, and then no more charts. Yeah, you're not a chart person. It's OK. I, I, <laughs> as in, you know, when you go to engineering school, you don't realize that the rest of the world doesn't speak in math and charts and what have you. I've come to appreciate that. So we'll, we'll get through this. Let's say that a developer comes to us and says, uh, I have a piece of property here I'd like to build upon. I am willing to build all of the residential homes, all the commercial buildings. I will, at my expense, put in the required roads and streets and curb and sidewalk. 
I'll pay for the pipes and the pumps and the valves and the meters. I'll do those all to your standards. I will follow all of your rules and regulations. I'm not asking for any subsidies of any type. The only thing that I'm asking as a developer is that when I'm finished making this huge investment in your community, that you, the city, the public, agree to take over the long-term responsibility to serve and maintain all this stuff. What, what would we say? Yeah, we'd say, fantastic. We spend nothing, you spend everything, we get all this new growth. This is, this is wonderful, right? Let's say, you know, we're from Austin, we're very smart people, we're very prudent, we want to do the right thing. We've heard of this strong town stuff. So what we're going to do when the money from this new development comes in, we're going to take the portion that would normally get siphoned off and spent in other parts of the city fixing and maintaining stuff, and we're just going to set that portion aside. And every year when that money comes in, we're going to take that portion, we're going to set it aside, and we're going to allow it to accumulate so that when we get out a generation from now and we have to make good on this promise we made that we'll fix and maintain and take care of this stuff, we'll have a pot of money to do that. This is what that looks like. In year one, everything is brand new, hasn't cost you anything. The money comes in, you take that portion, and, and, and you set it aside. In year two, you add to what you had in year one. In year three, more money comes in, and you add a little bit more. Year four, year five, and you can see a five-year-old road isn't costing you anything. A 10-year-old sidewalk isn't costing you anything. A 15-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. And so the money's just coming in, and you're continuing to accumulate. You get out a couple of decades, and you've got quite a pile of cash. You're feeling very rich. The problem is, in this example in year 25, when you have to actually go out and spend money to fix stuff, what you find is that the cumulative amount of revenue is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, you run far into the negative. Now, cities are not one development, right? Cities are a series of development, a collection of neighborhoods. So let's say that our developer comes back in a couple years later. He says, you know, that project worked out really well for you, worked out really well for me. I would like to do a similar size development. And every other year from this point forward, the developer walks in the door with a, a similar size development. In other words, the, the ideal scenario that all cities covet, nice, steady, continuous growth. And we take that money and we set it aside and we save it for the day when we have to make good on all these promises. This is what that looks like. In your first year, you've got your first development. It pays in for the entire 25 years shown. Year three, you've got another one. Year five, year seven. And you can see that not only do you not have any expenses, you know, it's just positive money coming in, nothing going out, uh, but you are having growth upon growth upon growth. You're feeling very, very successful. Your cash actually has starts to accelerate upwards. And when you get to year 25, the year you have to make good on that very first promise you made way back in year one, You've got to spend a little bit of money, sure, but it's not a big deal, right? You've had all this growth. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money over the long term on every project that you do, the further you go out into the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is the answer to that question I started with. Why, why are cities struggling? Why, despite all the growth and the job creation and the incentives and everything we have done to create prosperity, why do we struggle to do basic, basic things? It's because we live way out here on the far edge. Right? Let me ask you a couple questions. First of all, do you recognize yourself in this chart here? Do, do, do you see yourself here? We're having this kind of bizarre election season where you know, we're being asked to look at the way we go about things uh, with two like, incredibly distorted lenses, 
right? When you look at this, though, do you, do you see the way you live? Th- these are, this is a human flaw, right? This is why people smoke, right? Th- this is why you will, uh, you know, sit on the couch and watch TV instead of going for a jog, right? Oh, I, I really am enjoying this ice cream. Oh, this show's really good. Uh-oh, heart disease, right? <laughs> We, we, are, we are wired as human beings to highly value positive things today and to deeply, deeply discount negative things in the distant future. That, that's a human failing. Let me ask you another question. What happened to the civilization thousands of years ago that built their development pattern around this human failing? It's not around anymore, right? They, they went away. Those ideas and that trial and error experimentation process were not transmitted to the next generation. They didn't become part of the DNA of how we build places. I've got one more chart. It's slightly more depressing than this one. <laughs> um, then we'll be done with charts and we'll move on to happy pictures and uh, no more of this complex, you know, math kind of stuff. Uh, But this one's really important. Um, This is a chart of debt. Everybody in this room uh, knows the debate we're having at the federal level about our national debt, right? $20 trillion we're coming upon. It's an insane amount of money. None of us can fathom, you know, what a a thousand billionaires looks like, let alone 20,000 of them, right? It's insane. Uh, when you look at this chart here, the bottom line, the blue one, uh, that's the growth post-World War II of our federal debt. The, the black one right above it is the growth in our GDP. The green one, the one that soars up like this, that's our private sector debt. That's debt that we share. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, auto loans, credit cards, margin interest accounts, student loans, private sector debt. The way we finance the first generation of this new experimental way to build a great, prosperous America was by using our savings and by reinvesting that illusion of wealth back into creating more growth. As that became insufficient to keep everything going, right? as the liabilities started to mount and climb, it took us a while to figure out what to do. But we eventually shifted from a model of growth through savings and investment to one of growth through debt accumulation. And debt accumulation has become such an important part of keeping our economy going that as we crossed over in the third generation of this new way of doing things, we actually allowed it to become predatory. We actually needed the growth so bad that we allowed our financial system to prey on our friends and neighbors. Our ability to continue this experiment by having our friends and neighbors take on accelerating levels of debt is simply not available. Obviously, there's some huge implications here. The mechanisms of growth that we become accustomed to are waning. The federal government, the state governments are vastly overcommitted. Your DOT is a financial basket case. And, and we could talk. I, the last time I was here, we, we, I did a presentation on transportation. We talked for like an hour and a half. You, you are the poster child for transportation spending delusion. Sorry. <laughs> um, hey, we're out of money. Well, let's use our rainy day fund. Hey, we're still out of money. Well, let's go borrow a bunch. Um, hey, we're still out of money. Um, you never ask, like, why are we out of money, right? Build, 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 build. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, the private sector is, is way overtapped. What this means for us at the local level is that we are going to be forced to absorb the costs of our development pattern. If we want that road fixed, we have to pay for it. If we want that pipe repaired, that money is going to have to come from us. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some incredibly large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now, I wasn't invited here this morning to tell you what you already all know, right? This is a debate we're having everywhere across this country. 
How big is the service cut going to be, and where is that going to be felt? How big is the tax increase going to be, and who's going to pay for it? It's critical that we see the third variable in this sentence, the third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build in a way that is functionally insolvent, there's no way our cities are going to avoid insolvency. As long as we continue to build in a pattern that gives us an illusion of wealth today in exchange for enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid default. Whether that is a hard default, like we see in places like Detroit and Stockton and San Bernardino, or whether it's a soft default, like we see in thousands of cities across this country, where we're laying off police and firefighters, we're not maintaining parks, we're shutting libraries early, we're putting off critical maintenance because we just don't have the money. We have to start talking about how we build places that are financially more productive. So how do we do this? Uh, Okay, we're doing all right on time. Early on in Strong Towns, I spent a, a, a week in, in California. And as I would get to the end, we're going to talk the rest of the time here about how we think differently about things. But I would get to the end of the presentation, and these Californians would keep asking me, Chuck, we're really angry. You didn't give us a solution. You came here with all this thing about how the world is ending, and you didn't tell us how to solve the problem. What is the solution to these problems? And it, it took me a while to grasp what they were actually saying. Because what they were actually saying was slightly different than the words that would come out of their mouth. What they were saying was this. Chuck, what can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? Right? There, there are no such solutions. Right? The, these problems are unsolvable. Uh, what we have created for ourselves is a complex set of interwoven challenges. And what we talk about at Strong Towns are not solutions, but rational responses. How do we, as smart, thoughtful, intelligent people, working together, living together in a community, look at this complex set of challenges, roll up our sleeves, and respond as rational, thoughtful people? As a way to think through that, I always want to start here. Again. This is my hometown back in the early 1900s. When I first saw this photo, I, I was just blown away. I, 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 I love the look of the street. You know? the, the way the public realm is framed, the buildings line up. It's just the right like Greco-Roman ratios. The, there's great segmentation of the space. The buildings themselves have great symmetry. They, they front the street in just a perfect way. This is an exquisitely designed street. Let me ask you some questions about these people here. How thick was their zoning code? <laughs> How many boards and committees did you have to go to in, in this city to get an approval to build something? How much tax subsidy did they give out? How many state grants and federal incentives did they get? How many miles of pipe and road did they build to attract this development? How many shovel-ready sites did they have? How many engineers and planners and economic development advisors do they have on staff telling them how to do all this stuff? We can go through the litany of things that we have convinced ourselves is, are absolutely essential to building great places. They had none of them. These were a bunch of illiterate lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere. They didn't even have 30-year mortgages. How did they do this? How did they do this? It's really, really simple. They copied what they knew worked. They took the materials they had on hand, and they built in a pattern and a style that they had seen work for thousands and thousands of years. After all the incentives for growth, all the job creation programs, all the tax subsidies, all the infrastructure we built, all the advice from engineers and planners and et cetera, to make this city a fantastic place, here's what this exact same street looks like today. Yeah, it's a wasteland of parking and half-occupied buildings. And if you want to grasp in one snapshot why our cities struggle today, understand that there's a half million dollars of infrastructure in that little stretch of street right there. Where is the wealth that is going to take care of that generation after generation after generation? You know, I was, I was giving a lecture 
in Boise, Idaho. And I, was, uh, I got to this slide, and a, a student uh, raised their hand, stood up, and said, uh, Chuck, I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a very poor country. We can't afford to build the way that you build here. When we build, we have to build one block at a time. And before we build the next block, we have to make sure that every gap on the block we just built is filled in. Otherwise, we won't be able to afford it. Costa Rica is a very poor country. We can't afford to build this way. We're a very poor country now, too. We can't afford to build this way either. And for a long period of time, that illusion of wealth made us think that this kind of thing didn't matter. That we could have whole parts of our community that just went into a decline or were abandoned or, or, or you know, didn't reach their potential. Because we were so rich, we had so much growth, we had so much stuff going on that it, it just didn't matter. It didn't matter. Well, it, it does matter. And what we're starting to wake up and realize is that not only is this development pattern uh, financially insolvent, uh, but the key to actually starting to deal with that is to look again at these places and say, how do we make better use of them? So how do we start to think differently about all this? The first thing we have to do is get rid of our worst inclinations. Build it and they will come is a fantastic movie plot. It is a terrible economic development strategy. We are so conditioned today to believing in the build it and they will come mantra. It's, it's, it's hard to even realize that even a generation ago, this is not how we did things, right? This is part of what we call the desperation phase of this experiment. We're so desperate for growth that we actually uh, go out and do all this stuff, make all these crazy, crazy investments to try to induce it and create it. This isn't how cities build wealth. And this isn't how cities have ever built wealth. I'm going to show you right now the very simple mechanisms that cities use to build wealth. Does this city look familiar to you in any way? If I said this was Minneapolis, would it shock you? Really? Minneapolis used to look like that at one point. It's clearly not Austin, right? The trees are wrong, the, the building style's wrong. But we can go back in time, and there was a point in time where Austin looked like this, right? A, a little collection of pop-up shacks, right? San Antonio started like this, Dallas, Fort Worth. They were all like a, a little collection of little pop-up buildings, right? Houston, New Orleans, uh, San Francisco, Vancouver, Chicago. We can go back far enough. Manhattan at one point looked just like this, right? In its early, early days, a little collection of, of pop-up buildings. We can go back even further. London, Paris, Rome, you know. There, there, there could be a picture of Romulus and Remus standing in a place like this. Every single city that was ever built prior to our new experimental way to build started out just like this a little set of pop-up shacks, some hopes and some dreams. We built thousands of these across this continent. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict or project or even to fully understand after the fact, a lot of these places failed. What happens when a place like this fails? Does the stock market crash? Does unemployment skyrocket? Do we have to have an emergency session of Congress to bail out Wall Street banks? No. These are little bets. A few people lose a little bit of money. They salvage what they can. They move on to the next place. We built thousands of these across this continent. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict, our ability to project, or even our ability to fully understand after the fact, a lot of these places were successful. And when they were successful, they would grow in a very simple to understand way. They would grow incrementally up, 
incrementally out and become incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years, this little pop-up street, which is my hometown in 1870, would become that street I showed you earlier. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing up, incrementally growing out, and incrementally becoming more intense, the street of two and three story wood structures would become one of buildings with brick and granite. We don't build wealth by going to the casino and putting it all on red. The way we build wealth is by making small investments over a broad area over a long period of time. Let me show you how powerful this style of building is. Here's two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them, you'll see they're the same size, the same area, the same amount of public infrastructure. Everything about them is the same except for the style of building. That old and blighted block looks like this. In the 1920s, as my city was growing incrementally, the next increment of out were these three blocks. So what you are looking at is the 1920s equivalent of the pop-up shack on the far outskirts of town. Had things continued on, as they had for thousands of years, what would have happened? You would have eventually gotten second, third stories. These buildings would become more ornate, more intense. Of course, that's not what happened, right? What happened is we had the Depression, we had World War II, and then we just skipped right over these places and started building out on the edge. These three blocks have stagnated for 90 years. The city labeled it blight. They had the block two over, torn down, and now we have the new Taco John's drive through Everybody here thinks Taco John's is so funny. <laughs> do you, is, culturally, do we just not get Taco John's here, or what's the deal? <laughs> I, 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 here's the thing. I go to your, I go to your places that sell tacos. You, you don't have potatoes dipped in cheese. Like what, what, what kind of Mexican food do you have down here? <laughs> so this is our Taco John's. Everybody was thrilled about this, right? We got rid of blight. We now have a building that meets all the setback requirements. It meets the parking ordinance. It meets the sign you know, re requirements. The, the, the engineer was happy because we got rid of the on-street parking. Now the cars can flow through more smoothly. The environmental people were happy because now we have a little bit of green space and they got them to plant native plants in the stormwater area, right? The bike ped people are even happy because they got a little bit of a sidewalk there. Here's what nobody bothered to consider. That old blighted rundown block has a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny and new block, the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, the day it was built, it's only worth $800,000. So city's actually collecting 42% more taxes from that old, rundown, junky block. Understand what you're looking at. You are looking at the traditional pattern of development, the way we built places for thousands of years around the world. In its infancy, after 90 years of neglect, and it still outperforms, by a wide, wide margin, the stuff we build brand new today. And we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? 20 years from now, there'll be a new taco joint up the road. This one will be turned into a used car lot. 10 years later, it will be boarded up. We'll be looking for a grant or something to get it torn down, right? We've all been around long enough to see this transition. In fact, in the three years since this was built, here's what's happened to the taxable value of these two properties. We see the same kind of thing out on the edge of our cities. This is our Mills Fleet Farm. Mills Fleet Farm, 19-acre, double-sized big box store, auto dealership, gas station. You, you remember Mills Fleet Farm? I do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Glorious, right? No. Come on now. What kind of Minnesotan are you? <laughs> Mills Fleet Farm, when you walk in the door... Verify this for me. You, you've been in Mills Fleet Farm, right? I've driven past my Oh, come on. When you walk into Mills Fleet Farm, it has uh, auto parts, uh, animal feed, uh, lumber, guns and ammo, camouflage lingerie. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's the product mix. You, you, I feel like they would work really well here in Texas. I'm not sure why you don't have any. But th these are huge in the Midwest. 
Uh, this is our 19 acres, our most valuable piece of property in the entire area. When these people show up at a council meeting, we just stop the meeting and ask them, like, what, what do you need, right? <laughs> Here's 19 acres of our core downtown. Uh, if you've seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a not-so-flattering but not-so-inaccurate portrayal of uh, my hometown. Um, the downtown's kind of a rough place. Uh, most of the second, third stories are not occupied. The first stories really struggle. Uh, there have been no buildings built in my lifetime, plenty that have burned down or been torn down to make way for parking lots. When we look at that uh, 19 acres on the edge of town, we see a total value of $0.6 million per acre. It's a, it's a huge sum of money in one lot. But when we go to the 19 acres in the downtown, what we find is that it has a value of 78% greater. How much should we spend to get that wealth out on the edge? Hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Highways, frontage roads, backage roads, sewer and water expansions. How much did my generation spend to get that wealth in the downtown? Nothing, right? That, that was wealth that my great-great-grandparents and their contemporaries built slowly and incrementally and then bequeathed to us as an endowment of sorts that would just continue to pay back year after year after year. What happens when Mills Fleet Farm goes out of business? I don't know. But what we are pretty confident with, because we've seen this happen, right, when these places close, is that whatever comes next is lower on the economic pecking order than what's there now. You're looking right now at the peak, right? There are 134 different properties in the downtown. What happens if one of them goes out of business? What happens if one of them loses a tenant, retires, right? What happens if, in our infinite wisdom, we figure out that as planners, we have too much uh, retail and zoning and not enough office zoning, right? We have too much residential and not enough commercial. Well, these buildings are highly flexible. They're highly adaptable. You, you don't need to be able to predict the future when you build in such an adaptable way. Our new style of development not only is not very financially productive, but it's not very adaptable or flexible. The traditional pattern of development not only is financially really, really productive, but it is adaptable and flexible. There's a reason our ancestors, and I say that in the largest sense of the term, there's a reason why our ancestors built this way. We see this reflected in cities across the country. I'm going to show you now, uh, in the third dimension, the work of Joe Minicozzi uh, modeling value per acre. If you think of a farmer going out and spreading seed across a field, the, the, the parts of the field that grow up the most robustly, we say, are the most productive. What I'm going to show you now, value per acre, is financial productivity. Where is the most financially productive parts of our development pattern? This is Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York has lost population every census since World War II. It's been a steady decline. Their core has been hollowed out. Yet when we step back and say, where's the most valuable property in Buffalo, New York, can you point to their traditional downtown? Not only is it financially still a huge repository of wealth, but it dominates everything else around it. We can say the same thing in smaller cities. This is one of about 60,000 in upstate New York. It's the same pattern. This is a very small city of 1,200. When I first went to this place, they said, Chuck, uh, we've got some great stuff going on down here. We've got some great stuff going on up here. But these core neighborhoods are just terrible. We've got to figure out how to get this stuff torn down and get something good built in there. And then we showed them where all their wealth was in those poor neighborhoods, in the neighborhoods with all the poor people. Joe uh, Minicozzi, who was Urban Three, his team and I were invited to come to Lafayette, Louisiana. And to not just do a study of where the revenue is coming from, but to actually go deeper and say, where is the city spending money and where is the city bringing money in? And we looked at every single property in the city and every single expense in their budget and said, how can we map this out and show what's going on? And so I'm kind of, I feel a little impotent right now because I, we, we put this map together. It's red and green. Every place where you see red, you have a parcel that is going to cost the city more than what they're bringing in taxes. Every place where you see green is a parcel that is bringing in more money than they are uh, going to spend. Uh, the reason for my impotence is that this 
clicker does not work on this screen. And I have come to realize that there are many people, like 3% of the population, that is red, green, colorblind, and are just seeing a blob here. So uh, I can't point, and I can't, you know, dice this out. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to explain what's going on with this map, because it, it's really essential to understand. In the middle of this, there is a big spike that goes up. That spike, hey, yes. You saved the whole presentation. <laughs> so that spike is green. That is a new urbanist development near the core of the downtown. By new urbanist, uh, what I'm talking about is modern building style, mo uh, I'm sorry, traditional building styles with modern financing techniques. So very tight neighborhoods, tight streets, but everything built all at once to a finished state. It's an open question how well this development will do in the future. In, 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 a, in two decades, everybody's roof is going to fail at the same time. Everybody's driveway is going to go bad at the same time. Everybody's you know, appliances will fail at the same time. right? Without a renewal mechanism in that neighborhood, it's not clear what will happen. Traditionally, what happens is you get a jump, and then when you hit that renewal spot, you start to experience decline. We'll see. Right now, today, it's, it's the most valuable area in town. To the right of that, if you'd circle that little green area, right to it, go, go down a little bit, just that little area right there is all green. That is their core downtown. Now, if you've ever been to Lafayette's core downtown, you probably did not like, take a bunch of photos and post them on Facebook, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's not a great place. They are trying. It's getting better. Uh, I won't criticize them because they are working on it. Um, but, you know, it's a college town. There's a lot of dive bars. There's a lot of places where students can buy tacos for, you know, a buck. Um, it's not like a great, it's not a great place. There's a crescent of green to the, uh, to the right uh, of, yep, it runs right from there all the way down. That's that crescent of green. Those are the poor neighborhoods. Those are the neighborhoods where when we were going there to get an Airbnb, the city staff said, don't, don't, don't go to those places. That's where the burglaries happen, the, the, the murders happen. Just stay away from there. Everything else, and you can just do a big swath around the outside. All of this is red. All of this is red. What, what, what's going on out there? Is your big box stores, your strip malls, your drive through restaurants, your suburban subdivisions with the sweepy streets and the, the cul-de-sacs with the, you know, the, the, the three-car garage with the attached house, right? <laughs> the, there's two subsidies represented in this map. And they are subsidies universal to the American pattern of development. Subsidy number one, the poor neighborhoods subsidize the affluent neighborhoods. Subsidy number two, future generations subsidize current generations. If you live in Lafayette today, you pay $1,500 a year in taxes to the city, a typical family. You'll pay school and county and state. You'll pay other taxes, but $1,500 to the city. In order to make good on every promise shown on this map, your taxes would need to go from $1,500 a year to $9,200 a year. One out of every $5 you make as a typical family would need to go to the city just to make good on the promises shown in this map. That will never happen. And because it won't happen, what is going to come about is that future generations are going to have to decide what neighborhoods to fix the road in? What places to repair the pipe? What places to provide police and fire protection? This seems crazy to us, right? This seems bizarre. Yet we have a model of this in this country. We have a place where we've seen this happen, where the city grew a lot and then started to contract and let things go. We are in this insane election cycle, right? It's just bizarre where we're asked to look at the world through these crazy set of glasses, right? And if you look at Detroit today, 
if you subscribe to a, a right-wing narrative or a left-wing narrative, you have a, a, a very narrowly focused way that you can explain Detroit, right? Detroit is, you know, wealthy auto companies. Detroit is, you know, lazy unions. It's people not paying their share. It's those people. What, whatever your screwed up way of looking at the world is, you can apply it to Detroit with all smugness and confidence, right? I will give you my smug way of looking at Detroit. Detroit got started on this experiment ahead of everybody else. And they have arrived at the destination ahead of everybody else. This map is what we see in every city across this country. Every city that we've modeled, we see this exact same thing. We have built more stuff than our wealth will take care of. And so at some point, our cities are going to have to deal with that difficult, difficult challenge of unwinding those promises. I, 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 I love being here in Texas because um, in Texas, you, you have growth, right? And it's funny because I remember back when your former governor was running for president, and all of the politicians up on stage like to rip on what state? What state do you guys rip on more than any else? California. Yeah. It's like, we're not California. Uh, you know, we have growth. We got all, you know, we're not backward like them. But here's a fascinating thing. <laughs> you remember Ronald Reagan? Where he came from? California, right? We, we, California did not have to have air conditioning to get started on this experiment. You, you guys did. It, it, it took you a couple decades for them to, to, to get going before you got going. You, you're 20 years behind them, right? If you look at your, your growth cycle, your, your trajectory, you're just, you are Cal... California 1995 is Texas 2015, right? You're just 20 years behind them. I want you to think about what these buildings look like as a way to start to understand how we can do things differently. And really, the challenge is not technical. The challenge is cultural. So these are from North Carolina. They could be from anywhere. We see the same kind of values. Here's a Kmart at 384,000 an acre. Here's a Walmart at 967,000 an acre. Here is uh, an old warehouse converted into a supper club, same city, 5 million an acre. And then here you have Jimmy's Pizza, $3.4 million an acre. Look at that building, Jimmy's. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Do the people of Austin have the sophistication, the wherewithal, the capacity to build something as refined and exquisite as Jimmy's Pizza? <laughs> because if you do, look at the amount of wealth that we can build. One of the things that you suffer from here almost more than any other place in this country uh, it, it is, and I think some people would chalk it up to Texas, right? Texas, everything is big, right? That's, that's what you like to tell yourselves, and I get that. It is. Everything is here is big. I agree. Um, but it almost puts us to where small is beneath us, right? Like if it's not, like go big or go home, right? If, it, if it's not big, we're not interested. And when we step back and, and travel this city, at two miles an hour instead of 45 miles an hour. What we see is that this is a city just full of gaps. There's nothing but space here. There's nothing but, but gaps in your city. Yeah, yeah, we're good. And so when we can look at a place like Jimmy's Pizza and kind of humble ourselves to understand that we actually, I mean, we could build something way better than that, right? <laughs> I know we can. But if we just can work at that scale, look at the amount of wealth we can create. Look at the amount of opportunity we create. And look at how easy it actually is. Now, it's insane to think about doing something like that here because of what? 
how, how, much, would, how much would it cost me to, to buy uh, a, a 15 foot wide chunk of land here? What, like a million and a half dollars, right? Um, you, have this, you have this really crazy uh, property distortion. And I, I want to talk about it a little bit. And I've been, I've been in a little bit of a squabble over the last two weeks uh, with people in the Portland area. And I've compared Portland. Where's my friend Jace? Um, I've compared Portland, uh, in its newest resident, uh, I've compared Portland to Austin when I was there. And I'll, I'll do it again here, because the dynamics of the places are very much the same, even though uh, the fundamental like cultural ethic is very different. The, 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 the motivations are very different. Uh, the regulatory environment is very different. The way they're dealing with their housing unaffordability crisis is very different. But the effect is the same. And it's the same, I think, for some very fundamental, easy to understand reasons. This is Joe Minicosi's map of, of, uh, of the Austin area. And um, you can see this huge purple spike, which is your downtown. Um, in the modeling that Urban 3 has done around the country, uh, Austin is this crazy anomaly. They've not done Portland yet. Uh, but Portland, I think, would be the same way. Um, you have the highest spike and the widest, like, you know, flat area that is anywhere in the country. The, the dichotomy between the value per acre out here and the value per acre here is, is huge. It's huge. I want to walk you through a, a thought exercise as a way to get your mind around what I see going on as someone who has you know, worked with developers and, and, and worked with people who acquire and build and develop land. Um, this is the mechanism that I see happening in, in your city and in Portland and in San Francisco and in other major cities that are experiencing a housing crisis the way you are. Let's think about three properties right next to each other. A single family home, a vacant lot, and then a, a tower, right? And we can go around Austin and we can find this situation, right? Ponder these three for a moment. Let's say that you own the vacant lot in the middle and you're going to sell it. How much would you ask for that vacant lot? Well, what you would do is you would look around and you would say, what could be done on this lot? What, you know, what, what could someone build? And you can look over at the single family home and let's say, and I, you're going to have to bear with me here because I realize this is really low for your market, but I'll show you why. A, a typical single family home in Texas would be a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we look over and we see a house that's a couple hundred thousand dollars and we say, well, if we sold it to someone who's going to build a house, our land would be, you know, worth 30,000 or so. What, what, what you would pay for a house. But then we look over on the other side and we see this tower and we say, okay, the tower is valued at $10 million. If I were going to sell it to someone who's going to build a tower, what would I ask then? I would ask a lot more, right? I would ask a million and a half dollars, some you know, crazy amount of money. So now what, are you, what would you sell? Would you rather have 30000 or a million dollars? Right. And so what happens is the land gets valued based on what in real estate terms we call the highest and best use, right? Okay. Now, what's the value of that single family home? It's not 200,000 anymore, right? It's something like much 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 higher. It's something much higher. And why is it much higher? Because it's essentially like dead property, right? It's like a scrape off now. And so the bizarre thing about both Portland, and, and, and I think even more so in Portland, but your city to a degree, is that we can go through neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood where homes are valued statewide, far above the statewide median. Yet they visually look really run down compared to what you would have. You, know, you see a $600,000 house, a $700,000 house, and it does not look like a $700,000 house, right? <laughs> why is that? Well, why would you put any money into fixing up your house? Why would you put in granite countertops? Why would you put an addition on the outside? All of the value is in what? 
It's in the land. So any improvements you make in the property are irrational. You combine this with the fact that throughout the vast majority of your city, you're not allowing it to breathe at all. You're not allowing it to grow and renew. There's no mechanism to take your wide swaths of single-family neighborhoods and start converting some of those homes into duplexes or adding accessory apartments or doing just basic, basic incremental development the way we've seen around for thousands and thousands of years. And so your market demand is being met in two ways. One, in really high-end, big stuff with distorted land prices. Or two, way, way, way out on the edge where people have these brutal, brutal commutes create you know, all your congestion, and you're taking on these enormous long-term liabilities. This is not a natural system. And it's a system that I feel like you have, in a sense, created by the way you have chosen to respond to the set of pressures that you have. How would we do this differently? Um, one of the things that we uh, have, have talked about at Strong Towns, and, and I think the way to interpret the incremental growth development that we have shown you in this presentation, where you start with the little pop-up shacks and then you go to the next, you go to the next. The reason why I show you Jimmy's Pizza is because we have to start thinking in terms of freeing up the, the increment. Instead of having growth just be here, 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 and here, what you actually need is for your carpet to thicken up. Your neighborhoods need to mature. They need to actually, your growth should not happen in that big spike. It should actually happen over a broad area over a long period of time. And so what we have to start thinking of is how do we, and, and for me, I, I think we're in this real weird anomalous space, how do we on one end kind of tamp down the thing that is creating the land distortion. At the same time, we take our, our boot off the neck and actually loosen up the stuff that is artificially keeping these areas from expanding. It's a dual strategy that I think we have to talk through. Um, I realize that that is not an easy conversation. There are tons of vested interests. There are tons of people who have notions of what should be, whether it is from a, a planning theory standpoint or a development standpoint, or they have acquired land at a certain value and have certain expectations. I think if we want to... See, you can look at Portland and, and, and Austin and see the same building dynamics and two different ways of dealing with the problem, neither with them have been effective. In Portland, they do inclusionary zoning and all kinds of regulation to require you to do certain things. And what happens is that they get a little bit of affordable housing each year. But in, in the totality of it, it's insufficient. And their housing prices are bizarre. Here, you have chosen to, uh, you've kind of convinced yourselves that if we just accelerate the rate at which we can build and build more of this distorting stuff and more out on the edge, that eventually we'll reach the point where we saturate the market and prices will come down. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've thought that one through. Uh, that's not going to be a happy day for anyone, right? You will, you, you will eventually, you, you can, uh, in theory, build your way out of this and get back to you know, price equilibrium. Um, price equilibrium is going to be a, a hard fall, right? I think we have to talk this one through. And I am not suggesting that I know, like, there's an easy answer or I know it. Uh, but I think we have to put some of these things uh, on the table as part of the conversation. Uh, our website is strongtowns.org. Uh, I'm I still writing two, three times a week. Uh, but now we have a cast of other people who are writing. We release two, you know, three, four articles a day. Uh, we do a podcast a couple days a week, a lot of video, a lot of graphics. Uh, what we are trying to do is share this message with as many people as possible. And so if you um, go on our site and you find something that you find compelling, all of our stuff is Creative Commons licensed. So you can copy and paste something I wrote 
uh, put your name on it and pretend you wrote it, and that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> um, we are just trying to get these ideas out uh, to as many places as possible. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, let's all give Chuck a strong vacation. I just wanted to say that we are here until 10.30, so I have 20 minutes for uh, questions for Chuck. Um, and I'm going to be going around like uh, Phil Donahue or Jerry Springer. <laughs> and please speak clearly into the mic. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. Uh, the the graphic that you had of the big box store, uh, kind of in the the Jimmy's public, Pizza. No, 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 no. The uh, the big box. Uh, the Mills Fleet Farm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what that brought to mind for me is not only the public expenditure, but the private expenditure of accessing those places that are further out. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the 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 burdens and constraints placed on citizens and their expenses and in. in uh, accessing those assets once they're built. Yeah. Um, you mean the fact that we have to drive there and sit in congestion and it's inconvenient. Um, to me, I, 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 okay, you, you have, I can't remember what the term was that was used in my introduction, but congestion. You have like stifling congestion, right? You do. You have insane levels of congestion. Uh, you created essentially like watersheds of traffic to funnel everybody to one spot and artificially create congestion twice a day that's uh, overbearing. It, this creates huge burdens on all of you. It wastes your time. It wastes your energy. It's a, it's a cost. It's a cost to you. Um, you've all accepted it because it's the, like, the way things are. And it does kind of, you know, it, it makes certain living arrangements uh, financially uh, seem to make more sense because you're spending less time. Other people are willing to spend uh, more time and, and, and pay less financially. Here's, to me, the, the takeaway from that. When you have these weird use regulations, uh, what you do is you create these uh, winner-take-all kind of places, like the Mills Fleet Farm, and you force everybody to go there. We're all about choice, right? We're, in, in Texas, it's freedom, you know, liberty. You do what you want to do. Well, what if I want to open? What if, what if I see all the congestion in my neighborhood and I realize that I want to start like a corner grocery store because I can make money doing that because all these people would pay 20 cents more for a jug of milk than spending 20 minutes sitting in the car getting there. Can I do that? No, I can't do that. Why? I, I live in the state of liberty. Why, why can't I do that? Right. So you have these insane set of regulations. What, what, to me, congestion, congestion is a good thing because it shows people want to be in a place. The way you respond to congestion is not by building more transportation capacity. The way you respond to congestion is by building more stuff for people to be in. So you respond to the demand, like, why are people here? Well, because that's where the jobs are. Well, let's build places for people to live near where the jobs are. And let's allow more jobs out where people live. And what you'll see is that actual market start to equilibrate. Please. Oh. I th ah, go ahead. Uh, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Um, I had a question about your 3D modeling, which was yeah. fascinating. Um, it's but, not mine. Joe okay. Minicozzi with Urban 3. Okay. Can yep. you expand on what went into that modeling in terms of subsidy? Were you just focused on local subsidy? And I'm thinking about federal subsidy, specifically um, around home ownership and how that would impact. Now, l let's draw a distinction because we were the, the, the first ones I showed, Buffalo, Williamsport, Crosby, those were just revenue. Those were just value. So those were property values. There's a very simple map. You guys have actually, uh, I know your staff has actually put one of these together here. You can do this in like an afternoon. It's very easy to do. Value per acre. The Lafayette one took a long time and it was really intricate. Um, so when I say subsidy, um, what all we looked at in Lafayette was 
the amount of revenue that the city was getting from the people who lived in the city and the amount of expense the city was spending on those same people. Um, When I said subsidies, uh, what I was referring to is that the poor neighborhoods pay way more than what they get in service, where the affluent neighborhoods, it's opposite. And the fact that future generations are going to deal with this imbalance. Right now, you read reports from like the Builders Association, and they'll say, well, new growth not only pays for itself, it pays for everybody else too. And they are right if you look at a very short period of time. Remember those charts I showed you? When the developer comes in and puts in the new development and pays for everything, uh, it costs you nothing. So all the cash you have coming in is you know, paying for itself. It's excess money. All you've had to do is take on this liability, this promise in the future. It's as if I give you like you know a thousand dollars today in the agreement that you'll give me a hundred thousand dollars twenty years from now. Like, well, I've subsidized you today. Have you really no? Because if you do a balance sheet, it would show that. So um, we're strictly looking at the local numbers. We're not looking at like who's getting a Medicare payment, who's getting a Social Security payment where all that cash, what we're looking at is the system of the city. Um, I don't know who has the microphone. Uh, right here. Please. In uh, on election day, we're going to uh, vote for a $720 million bond issue That's what in I the hear. city of Austin, mostly to fix up our urban corridors, which need a little TLC. Uh, how do you see this in the uh, growth and, uh, I, is, in other words, is this just the beginning of the iceberg? Uh, and uh, you mean the fact are, that you have to spend that much? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's not um, okay. I, I'm not. Pre- I'm not predicting that every city is going to become Detroit in the sense that you're going to follow the same trajectory and have the same sex scandal at City Hall and, you know, uh, we're, we're all fragile in the same way and we're all going to experience the, the impacts that fragility in different ways. Um, but when you look at cities that go through this cycle, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear what happens. First of all, you have this period of growth and the growth creates the illusion of wealth and you all feel very wealthy. Um, that's why you can look at cities that have not experienced growth and all of a sudden they do and they go build the really nice city hall with all the nice facilities. They go build, you know, all, all the stuff. They can afford things now because they're having growth. What happens then is that we culturally create this expectation of, a, we can just call it blankly, like a quality of life, right? Like this is who we are. And at the political level, there's a lot of pressure to maintain who we are at the same time, you know, modestly raising taxes, if raising them at all, maybe actually decreasing them, that's where you get into the, the cultural back and forth. You know, um, I'm going to raise taxes. You know, no, I can do this without raising taxes. And what you see is very clearly uh, local governments kind of reflect exactly what we see at the macro level. In the second life cycle, as things start to age, as the liabilities climb, what we do is we take our cash And we, instead of spending cash to meet our obligations, we convert those cash to debt payments because debt payments can go a lot further. It's basically, you know, what can someone else change about what they do so that I don't have to change what I do? Well, one of the things that other people can change is they can start spending their cash on debt instead of cash on doing things. And that buys you like another generation, right? But then you wind up at the end of the second you know, a, a second generation of doing that, and you have huge amounts of debt, and you're in the same cash flow, you know, same wealth problem that you were before. We can look at a city like Ferguson, Missouri, which has obviously been in the news a lot uh, the last couple of years. Ferguson, Missouri was the place to be in the 1950s and 60s. It was the growth place. There's a reason why the entire <laughs> police department are, are, you know, white cops. And, you know, 98% of the population is not. Why? Because when you get in a government job with a pension, you don't leave it. And so as that city experienced the second generation, when things started to decline, taxes started to go up, debt started to be accumulated, uh, affluent people started to leave. 
And the only people that were left uh, were the people who couldn't leave because they had pensions and other things they didn't want to give up on. And so by the time you get to today, uh, Fergus, Missouri is spending like 25% of their budget every year on interest on their debt. And I want to say it, two years ago, they spent $50,000 on sidewalk maintenance. You know, there's a reason people walk in the street in Ferguson. It's because all their money is going to pay in debt. So debt freaks me out because we treat debt as a, as a cash flow problem instead of an insolvency problem. And we really need to recognize that it's, it, it's an insolvency problem, not a cash flow problem. I think we have time for about three more questions. And I did want to say that all of our Imagine Austin speaker series are filmed and will be put on ATXN. So I noticed a couple people are filming. All of them are filmed and are on the website. Great. Thank you, Chuck. And yeah, uh, really, thank you. you've uh, uh, you know, uh, provoked some questions and thoughts in my mind about, the, about where we're headed here in our city. And you know, our city has uh, you know, densified the, by 50 to 7% over the past 15 years. And we've seen land prices skyrocket, as you alluded to earlier. And we've seen middle income families, low income families uh, being pushed to the edge of our city based on just the minimal amount of infill and density we've seen so far. But it seems like you're saying you really need to ramp up that density, you know, over, in, over a broader area, maybe like our urban core. It seems like that's what you're, you're recommending. And I wonder and I worry about if we do more density, if uh -huh. we, and there are some folks in our city calling for upzoning our urban core to a minimum multifamily, by right, minimum multifamily. No more single family in the urban core. Okay. And I worry that if we do that, our land prices, as fast as they've grown now, will just skyrocket and push even more people out of the urban core and so that only affluent people can afford to live here. And yeah. some cities have done that, and they're called imperial cities. And I worry that we might become an imperial city where the affluent folks can afford to live in the urban core. They have all the amenities, and the low-income families and the middle-class families are pushed to the edge because that's all, all they can afford. Yeah. Um, I have to, I have to uh, put some qualifiers on your, your opening thing because you said I seem to be pushing for density. And you'll note that I, I never use the term density in my entire presentation. If you go to our website and actually type in density, you'll find a lot of things that I've written uh, trying to get people to stop thinking in terms of density. Uh, I don't think density is the answer to any of our problems. Um, I've written many times that I think density may be a byproduct of successful development patterns, but there's no direct correlation between success and density. Um, I think ideas, sometimes I think we have a fetish with density. We've come to just ascribe density as the answer. And so it, it, it makes us, in almost like a religiously dogmatic kind of way, focus on it. And I, I think that that is the wrong way to look at our cities. Um, to me, my focus would be more on uh, the, the increment of development and how that development interacts with the, the, the places around it. And, and let me just give you, you know, two extremes. We could handle density by building huge skyscrapers, you know, big, huge towers in the core of the city and converting it into Coruscant, right? Like the big imperial city, okay? We, or what if every single household, single family household became a duplex? You actually would have more housing than you have demand if that happened. One, you would hardly notice, right? The other one would be dramatic and had all kinds of distorting effects. The other one, you, 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 would, you would not even, you would not, it would be imperceptible, okay? So to me, I, I'm not sure why our fetish brings us to, like, do this, and, like, this is, like, a, a non-starter. I, I realize culturally why this is a non-starter, because we, what happens is when we start talking about density in our fetish kind of way, uh, it comes out in these crazy projects. And then we go to a neighborhood and we say, oh, all of you people living in your nice single-family home neighborhood, we want density. And you all go, no, no. 
you know, because we know what like the fetish brings us. Um, if we started, to me, if we talked about by right, the next increment of growth needs to be allowed everywhere. And not because we're obsessed with density, but because we want our neighborhoods to be able to breathe and renew themselves and not get stagnant and decline. We actually want markets to work. Uh, to me, I feel like that's a healthier obsession and it may result in higher density, um, but it, it, it won't be the driving force. Please. So I appreciate you talking about Austin. Um, I think about all the towns around Austin and Central Texas, you know, that are on the start of their growth curve in terms of, you know, building subdivisions because there are subdivision developers out there. And, um, you know, appreciate our problems and you helped elucidate some of those problems. But I really think the, the value is in talking to Kyle and Buda and Round Rock. And I, I was in Hutto a couple years ago. Hutto. You know, I mean. Oh, no, please. See, they're, they're the ones that are on the start. No, of, it's, their, it's their day in the sun. Like, we finally, we made it. Right? But they're the ones that are, that are buying down the future. Yeah, they're toast. Right now. Yeah, they're, they're in toast. a world and of so, yeah. To me, uh, your message is actually uh, just very important for them. Yeah. Uh, it is important for us, and we're all dealing with it, but it's really, uh, there's a lot of people here that say, well, we don't want sprawl. Well, we can't do anything about sprawl because these other small towns, that's what they're doing. Right. Right? And so that's, that's where you can really be effective Right. In your message. He, 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 yes, I appreciate that. And I think you're right. Um, he, here's the, let me give you uh, millions of years of human history in 30 seconds. Uh, and so this is going to be very coarse. So cut me some slack. Obviously, there's nuance here. Uh, for thousands of years, cities were wealthy people surrounded by poor people. In the U.S., we decided after World War II that cities should be poor people surrounded by wealthy people. And when we made that shift, what happened is we left behind poor people in neighborhoods that were fairly coherent. And we began to build stuff for rich people out on the edge where you had to have an automobile and a very high financial burn rate to survive. You drive to the store, what have you. We are now in the process, and you can see it here, you can see it in other big cities, of, of Essentially, because things are breaking down and subsidies are going away, our cities are again starting to become rich people surrounded by poor people. And the danger, I mean, the, the real horrific danger of that is that the stuff out here does not work without huge amounts of resources, without a very, very affluent burn rate financially. And so what we are doing is we are trapping the poorest people into places that cannot be served by transit, cannot be served by you know, grocery stores, cannot be served by police, cannot be protected in a fight. You know, all of the things that you need, you cannot do. And the biggest danger I see in those like, truly suburban places is that they are... The, the level of desperation in those places, I, I see it coming, and it really makes me sad. Hi, Chuck. Uh, Hi. I, uh, I'm somewhat following on your answer for his question. I was thinking a lot about your final piece about land values. Yeah. Uh, and, but applying that to something. In Austin, we have currently a system of zoning to try to keep everything you're talking about from happening. Um, and I think it's very problematic um, and so there's been a long movement to change that and to develop a form-based code, right. and that is code next. Uh, and the battle lines are being drawn right now to say code next will apply to certain areas, uh, corridors and centers, uh, and we will make sure that you don't, we don't allow what you said. We don't allow duplexes in our family neighborhoods right. because we don't want families there anymore. Right. And so what does that do to that question of, of land values and balance, if you essentially have two cities, yeah. and and one of them can build condos everywhere, and one of them right. cannot. This is the this is the cultural problem. This is why you know 
all of these problems that we're dealing with um, are not engineering problems. They're not planning problems. They're, 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 not, they're, they're cultural problems that are manifesting in these other ways. And so, yeah, I, I've got two like, gut reactions to that. First of all, I, I think my gut says we shouldn't be trying to we shouldn't be insisting on changes for the entire city from a zoning standpoint uh, because what will happen is we will not be able to do anything. So we should get what we can and start working on it. I think that's like the pragmatic approach that's coming online. But then your second part of your question says, well, what, 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 is, what are the implications of that? And the implications of that is you're going to have a messed up, you know, you, when, when you have your boot on the throat of these neighborhoods and you don't allow them to... Uh, you know, to, to renew themselves, they will become places locked in decline and places where they're enclaves of affluent. And essentially, you will be subsidizing those enclaves of the affluent. As bizarre as that sounds, that, that's exactly what happens. Um, or you'll be locking places into decline. And in the market you're in now, it'll largely be the affluent, but when your market changes, it will become the former. Um, these neighborhoods need to breathe. And I, I think the conversation we need to have is, uh, again, and this is why I say if, if we're working on the code, we need to not lead with density. D density should I, like strip the thing from your plan to stop talking about it. We're not building density. We're building neighborhoods that can grow and mature and uh, renew themselves. And the development is, it needs to look very similar to the development that's there now. You should be able to walk down the street in a, in a decade and have a street that maybe looks thicker, a little bit more intense, a little bit more stuff, but, but very like recognizable to someone who goes down the street today. And if that's our thought process, I feel like we can overcome a lot of that pushback. The other side of this, and, and this is me using the financial, um, you know, there's carrots and sticks. To me, the financial stick uh, that I've talked to a, a number of cities about is when you go through that triage point, you know, I showed you Lafayette, and I said at some point in the future, you're going to have to make a decision on what neighborhoods are maintained and which ones not to. To me, the early stages of that conversation are this. You're, you have two choices in your neighborhood. Choice number one is we're going to loosen up the regulation to allow by right the next increment of intensity. You're not going to get huge density increases. You're not going to get towers. You're not going to get crazy stuff. But you are going to get the next increment of density. Or I just used that word. The next increment of <laughs> intensity. The next increment of intensity. And so if you agree to that in your neighborhood, we will agree to you know, come in and, and actually maintain your roads and your pipes and stuff. Because that's an investment that might make sense because as we build, you will build wealth and, and we'll, you know, we, the, the, the broader community, will share in that investment. But if you, choice B, want to keep everything as it is today and not allow your neighbor to mature at all, you just want to keep it like under glass, you know, sealed in amber, that's fine. But in our triage of deciding where we're going to put money, your streets are going to become private streets. And your utilities are going to become privately maintained utilities. And that's the, I mean, that's the way we will address that imbalance. Because we can't, in good conscience, tax the entire community to prop up your building decision, while at the same time we're looking at other neighborhoods that are committed to, to, to you know, the, committed to, like, the, the, the way we're building here, benefiting everybody, and, and say, sorry, we're walking away from you. That's a, that is a hard conversation. But to me, that's more consistent with actually being the stewards of the public purse than what you're doing now. This is going to be our very last question. Yay. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Chuck, thank you very much for coming. Um, I wanted to ask you to address one last question in terms of the 
evolution of our core neighborhoods. Yeah. Uh, we've got a bit of a timing problem in Austin because of our explosive growth. The market's running away from us, and we're now becoming a city of uh, an enclave of the rich, surrounded by rich people. Um, right. We haven't gotten to that stage yet where you described. But it's, it's also become a, an issue of social justice in that our core neighborhoods, and I would agree that we've got the boot on the neck in terms of regulation. Um, our core neighborhoods uh, are becoming unaffordable to most Austinites. Right. And if we go in too slow a fashion, in it's incrementalism, which I know you're a big fan of, um, then we fail to address the problem simply because things are moving away from us so quickly. There's been a proposal from some folks to simply allow more affordable forms of housing to coexist with our single family as we allowed some 70 or 80 years ago. Uh, small garden apartments, neighborhood scale, those we allowed to be built next door to single family back in the 1940s. Uh, could you comment on the timing issue yeah. and the uh, required evolution of the core neighborhoods? Yeah. Um, I see it a little bit differently. Um, l let, me, let me try to repeat what you've said in a slightly different way and see if, if I'm capturing what you're saying. You're saying that we have such demand for housing right now, like it's, it's, it's overwhelming, that if we insisted on it being incremental, we just couldn't keep up. Like, we, we have to build at scale. We've got to have big developers out building big things, or we're just going to be swamped. Okay, say... Then I'm not... I wasn't tracking what you... Right. Right. And you're saying, if we did that, what? Like, what's, what's, what would be the problem with doing that? Well, that's what I was asking. Oh, no, to, okay. To, to me, I, I, feel like the, I, I, I feel like we're, we're stuck with these two, like, really bad choices. And they're being driven by the way we finance growth and development. If, if my friend Joe, who did the 3D uh, charts, he used to work for... Can't, he's an architect. I can't remember what the He worked for a national insurance company. And part of what they did is they acquired properties around the country as part of their insurance portfolio. And he would describe, he described to me this process of doing it where they would walk in the door and go like, okay, guys, uh, we got $10 million we got to get rid of by Friday. Go buy. And they would just go out and like acquire properties, right? But they weren't acquiring like your home or your, they would acquire like a portfolio of homes and they would acquire like class C office space, you know, 2 million square feet. They would like do it in big chunks. Uh, they would have these like things where every now and then we did, they just have to go and buy, 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 buy. Because we've got, you know, this big flood of money came in and we got to go do something with it. When you look at that, to me, our developers today are responding to, to those market forces. So I can get a tower financed. I can get a hotel financed. I can get a big box store financed. I can get a housing subdivision with 80 homes financed. I can get all of that financed. Here's what I can't easily get financed. I can't get uh, the two-story commercial below with the residential above financed because there's no like secondary market for that. I have to finance that locally. That means I have to come up with a lot of money down. I've got to sit with a banker. I've got to go you know, through all this stuff. It's a slow process. So to me, and I, I, don't, I don't say this as an insult to your developers, uh, but you're lacking a type of developer more than anything else. You're lacking the kind of developer that does small incremental stuff. They, they just, they're, 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 a non -exist, they're an endangered non-existent species here, right? Because it's harder to do. It's harder to do at that level. Now, there's a group out there called the Incremental Development Alliance. Their goal is to train 10,000 people across the country who can work at that scale and make good money doing it. Uh, they're like targeting people who are underemployed and, and or passionate about cities or what have you. 
and they're trying to teach them and mentor them uh, to be that scale of developer that you need. To me, we can, we can be frustrated with our current developers because they won't work at a neighborhood scale. They won't come in and convert the single family home into duplexes and, and other, like, they're just like, ah, I can't work at that. No, they can't. Because their thing is all about efficiency and working in large chunks and what can be financed. It's the same with my friend Joe. They could never go out and buy you know, a ranch house in Hutto. You know? like it, it's not part of the, the, port, the scale of their portfolio did not allow them to work with that fine of nuance. You now need 30 years of nuance. You've built huge. Now you need to fill in gaps. And that actually means you need a different kind of developer. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> we have uh, the, the validation that, that if your parking ticket has not been validated and Katie has something to Katie's going to be doing it. If anybody has, and thank you once again for coming to the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. And again, we have a speaker series coming up on November 17th at the Thompson Center. Thank you.